Hi, I'm Mary Fassell, and in this brief video, I'll be talking about how to read a primary source, that is, a document written in the time period under study. I'll focus on written texts, but much of what I'll say could be applied to images or objects. So let's jump into a source. Here's a snippet of a document now held in the Wellcome Library in London. It has been digitized and is available online. I'll list resources on the final slide. This is a recipe, part of a book of recipes compiled by Anne Fanshawe in the 17th century. Before we start trying to interpret this text, we need to characterize it. What kind of source is this? I often jokingly refer to this as the dragnet method, like the old TV show. It's just the facts, ma'am, before we begin to interpret. To put it another way, we ask the same kinds of questions a detective does. Who, what, when, where, how, and why? So how might you answer these questions? As a student, sometimes you'll be reading a primary source in a reader, like this excerpt from John Aberth's excellent compilation of sources on the Black Death. He's provided an editorial header that tells you what he thinks you need to know about the source. He's answered the questions for you. But if you aren't reading in a collection, you need to answer these questions in one of two ways. First, you can look at the document itself for many of them. In this case, Anne Fanshawe inscribed her book, so we can begin to answer the who question right here, although you'll note she has a scribe, Joseph Avery, doing some of the actual writing. Second, you may need to dig a little in reference sources to find out more about your source. If you're in an archive, sometimes much of the information you need may well be in the catalog entry, like this one. This is the welcomes entry for this source. So the who in this case is pretty easy. This source was composed by Anne Lady Fanshawe, an aristocratic English woman who lived in the 17th century. On to the what question, which is about genre. When people write, they are usually doing so within conventions that shape how they write. You write an email to your boss differently than you text your teenager, at least I hope you do, or a thank you note to an elderly relative. Figuring out genre conventions can help us to understand what's included and what is not. For example, in Fanshawe's day, most letters were read aloud in the family circle. They were not the private documents we might imagine. So we need to read them, knowing that their intended audience was larger than the dear whomever to whom the letter was addressed. In this case, the genre is recipe book, as you can see. It's a genre that's received a fair amount of scholarly attention of late. Fanshawe's is a good example and has many features typical of the genre. Although it's interesting, those cross-outs, the X's, are recipes that evidently she didn't think worked, and that is a little more unusual. You can see here, she notes that she's tried this recipe herself and that it works. I have found good experimentally of this medicine, she says. Women were often compilers of such works, and some women's recipe books made it into print in the 1650s. Next question is when. For this source, it seems to have been over decades. The evidence in the book suggests Fanshawe's daughter Catherine was using it and adding to it in the early 18th century, decades after her mother had composed it. Fanshawe's own life was tumultuous. She lived during the English Civil War, and her husband was a royalist. That is, he sided with King Charles I, who was executed in 1649. The Fanshaws had a hard time of it. They were, in effect, on the losing side for a while. This political decision shaped answers to the where question as well. When London got too hot to handle, they lived in Oxford while Charles I was there. After his execution, they lived in Ireland and in France, with the exiled Charles II until his restoration in 1660 when Robert Fanshawe's loyalty to his monarch was rewarded with the post of ambassador to Spain. So this volume may well have traveled extensively. Perhaps we should not be surprised to see what looked like foreign or exotic ingredients here. Although by this point, London's apothecaries also stocked some pretty exotic wares. Our next question is how. On one level, it's a material question. Like other writers of her day, Fanshawe probably bought paper at a stationer's or bought the volume as a blank bound book, made ink either from oak galls or from a commercially available powder, and cut a goose quill to write it. Or she had her scribe do all that. In other words, writing was not an uncomplicated process. It required a number of material objects and paper was not cheap. At another level, the book reveals that it was made in a complex social matrix, 
Take a look at this page again. You can see in the margins from whom Fanshawe had got her recipes. In the middle of the page on the left, she's got one for colic that she had from her mother. Above that is one from an earl, and below that from Lady Beetles. On the opposite page, she has one from Sir Ken Elm Digby, who was also in exile in France with Charles II. But here it gets complicated. Digby had published a book or two of recipes, so just possibly she is referring to the textual Digby, not the flesh and blood one. So the how of this manuscript is intensely social. Our final question is why. Here often the why doesn't mean trying to fathom the author's motivations. Looking into someone's heart at a distance of centuries is difficult and often speculative. Instead, the why question that you might want to begin with is one associated with the noted historian of ideas, Quentin Skinner. To what problem was this document a solution? I'd hazard a guess that the problem was that of running an aristocratic household. You can see in this image, it's the title page of a 17th century book, some of the things that relatively elite women might be doing to keep their families together. Baby and child care, making butter, baking, and up in the upper right hand corner, distilling, that is, making medicines. And how much more might Fanshawe have had to do as she set up households in Ireland, France, and Madrid? Now the real work begins of interpreting the document. Here, of course, there are many paths, depending upon the questions you've brought to it. Perhaps you're interested in women healers, or in the trade in drugs, or in the relationships between Galenic and Paracelsian medicines, or in the history of cooking. This book is often claimed as the source of the very first English recipe for ice cream, or any number of other topics. Once you've laid some foundations for what kind of document this is, you've answered some of those who, what, when, where, how, why questions, you will be in a much better shape to interpret it. I hope I've got you off to a good start. And here's a few resources if you've been captivated by Fanshawe's recipe book.